Hi, I'm David Marchant, the founder of Offshore Alert, which investigates participants in high value cross-border finance with an emphasis on high confidentiality jurisdictions. Our specialty is exposing investment fraud while it's in progress. Enjoy our content. Good morning and welcome to our um, little talk on how to gather information in Russia and the CIS more generally. I'm, my name is Andrew Wordsworth and I'm joined here by Eugene Jazenko of Vantage Intelligence and Pavel Tokarov of Gambit Global Intelligence. Both of them after, come out of long and distinguished careers in investigations where both of them overlapped at the um, enormously distinguished investigations company Diligence. Um, I'm a founder of Radus, which is a, a um, large scale investigations firm specializing primarily in disputes related matters. Um, Pavel, should we go to you first of all to understand the regulatory background as to what actually happens in terms of yep. investigations in Russia particularly? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, hello everyone. Okay, well, um, uh, we start with uh, the overview of several, well, we'll talk about just several uh, regulations uh, in Russia uh, which are in place now and how we operate under them. Well, first of all, um, there may be this shared opinion that uh, investigating or collecting information in Russia, plus CIS, mostly in Russia, is somehow more dangerous, more difficult, somehow more complex. Um, well, our answer, well, my answer is no. Um, An investigation is Russia is as simple, well, it, which is not simple, but it's as simple as it is in in any other jurisdiction. Um, so you basically can collect information, you can talk to people and you, you should talk to people and you should and you can obviously use lots of open source um, resources. But you obviously, uh, well, as long as you do all this uh, legally and under the existing uh, regulatory framework. And we start with um, the first uh, probably most obvious uh, legislation there is, is the legislation that re regulates uh, the um, private investigators activities. Well, um, the regulatory framework here um, is very old. Uh, it was the law was adopted in 1992 and um, the new law is being discussed now, but no, well, there are no details disclosed whatsoever about the contents. So we'll talk about the old and currently existing law. Uh, the currently existing law, it uh, governs both. It governs the private uh, detectives, investigators, and all the security firms, uh, which creates a bit of confusion, which creates lots of uh, ambiguities, and it's vague, it's too general. Um, but let us let me tell you again what it, what it tells about the private investigators. Um, well, first of all, you obviously there is a license um, of a private investigator that um, one can obtain, apply for and obtain. Um, the problem with the license is that it grants you virtually nothing. Well, it doesn't grant you any additional privileges and it doesn't uh, allow you to do something that uh, another person, a normal, ordinary person wouldn't be able to do. For example, yes, you can collect information and yes, you can analyze and gather all this information, but you will need to get an authorization of a person um, on whom you're collecting the information and gathering it. Um, the, the, so the, 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 this legislation on per private detectives, they are, uh, this is regulated by the Russian Guard. It's a newly, well, recently established um, uh, sort of a separate entity to report directly to the president. So it's not the Ministry of Interior, not a military separate entity. Um, so yes, and as long as you as long as as long as you uh, operate under the legislation as a per private detective uh, under this law and under the laws that regulates the um, protection of information, then you're fine. 
Now, the problem here, again, is uh, the law on protection of information. We move into personal data protection. Uh, and that's, again, it's too general. Uh, it does not uh, differentiate between um, different actors, uh, different industries, uh, which uh, are there to process and gather information. So the law was adopted in 2006, uh, but it's been recently regularly edited and um, renewed. So the latest edition is literally this year, in April. Uh, but again, um, our experience and our understanding is that it does not so much apply to the intelligence um, community, to the activities of uh, the intelligence community. It is mostly aimed at um, it mostly aimed at uh, banks, uh, other or other entities on telecom who collect a lot of personal data and who um, are obliged by this law to process and store it uh, accordingly so it's not leaked. Um, when it comes to uh, the leaked information uh, uh, about different methods where different um, people may um, use to uh, obtain information, the, here you have to be careful about two other laws, uh, the laws of a criminal codes, uh, which um, one is in Article 137. It talks about it talks about the privacy law, so uh, you cannot obviously um, intrude into someone's private life. Um, and uh, another one is 272. The criminal code is the unauthorized access to the computer data and information. So um, that is more. Um, I would say that concerns probably more uh, the way information is obtained for intelligence. So you have to be careful about not to violate any of this. Um, uh, otherwise, otherwise, uh, the personal Prote personal data protection act is um, again too, too too general, not very uh, specific to the intelligence community. And obviously, yes, the information that also uh, the, the, the another article that you have to be aware of. Uh, well, it's um, when the information obtained um, is an accessory to um, a different, uh, like a, uh, an ultimate crime. So, for example, a theft. So, if information is accessed in a legal way, for example, so you collected the personal data on someone, but then used it to to commit a, a crime, like a theft of some. Um, if you collect banking information someone somehow, what no matter how, and then you use it to commit a theft, then obviously they're going to be um, considered as a criminal, as a crime under the criminal code. So now coming to the <clears throat> last slide um, uh, about what's probably much more pertinent to what we all do is the difference between uh, commercial espionage, competitive intelligence, and uh, the different kind of financial information and in how to and how the Russian legislation. Uh, looks at this at this uh, concept. So, uh, competitive intelligence, as such, is not defined by a law. It's not, it does not exist in the in the legal framework in Russia. Um, commercial espionage, um, likely the same. So, it's actually it's there is there is no such um, there is no such article of any code that would be called as uh, commercial espionage or, or, or like punishment for commercial espionage. The only article which is uh, which is applied is the article of the Criminal Code 183, which is actually about the unauthorized unauthorized access to and dissemination of commercial tax and banking secrets. So it actually groups all these um, all these different kind of data. Into it treats them similarly. So if if a person uh, accessed um, illegally, and that's and that's very uh, important concept here. So if you accessed illegally any commercial tax or banking data, and then you use it and disseminate it, and then yes, you might be punished uh, by the law uh, for 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 such activities. Well, actually, they're talking about the precedence of use, of of the use of this um, article. It's quite limited, but it's growing. Uh, over the last year, <clears throat> the last several years, has been growing, but mostly, again, it mostly uh, concerns well from from all the from all the recent uh, 
cases I've, I've monitored and I've seen, it was mostly actually solely about people working for different um, companies like banks and telecom who were or tax authorities who were selling this kind of information to the black market of information. Not person who were talking to people, not, not person, not even probably the person who were ordering this. Mostly people who are actually using their, 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 their position to disseminate and violate the law in this way, so to sell confidential um, commercial tax or bank information. Um, when, you, when, when, when it comes to um, gathering data, uh, and with the commercial data, for example, right? It's also very important to understand because the question may be asked, so, okay, uh, can I go and talk to people about their company's activities? Uh, can they talk to me back? Um, whether me or them going to be violating any law? That's a very uh, subtle field um, of, of law that in order to be violating a commercial uh, commercial uh, confidential information um, protection data protection act several factors has to be has have to be met so there should be a regime of confidential information at this company so there should be special special documents issued by the management and signed by every employee and so on and so forth at the same time there's lots of things they can include into confidential information about activities which is not going to be considered by the court of law as such, even if uh, they signed, yes, I cannot talk about this, this and that. And if they talk and they will be trying to go against them and maybe you, but uh, there, is, there is lots of information that cannot be considered confidential, even if the company wants it to be considered as such. For example, any, any, uh, com any information about the, the, the shareholders uh, and so on and so forth. So whatever is uh, about in the is in the uh, articles of association, all the information pertinent to the to the documents uh, that uh, found the company, for example. Um, so to to sum up um, is that to sum up, I'd say that the difference between, as it says on my slide, yes, between espionage and intelligence is really the methods of how you gather data and what data you gather. So unless you're not trying to make any person uh, access and sell you or pass you any confidential tax or banking information or any uh, information that would breach the, uh, the privacy uh, of, um, of this person, the privacy of their communication and so on and so forth, then you are fine. <laughs> well, um, that is it. Fascinating. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, it always interests me, this PI license. I mean, it's never occurred to me when commissioning information out of Russia or anyone in the CIS to ask if the person I'm getting the information from has a PI's license. Eugene, have you ever asked just a question which comes to your lips straight away? I've never asked that question explicitly, but I, I do know that in, in a lot of cases, uh, individuals, investigative professionals that would be qualified as detectives who work with foreigners in an open market generally do have a license, um, if only for, you know, for the reason of self-protection if, if needed, so as not to be liable for something. But you're right, it's not actually, it's not even a term, you know, licensed investigator or licensed detective is a word that is more often used in, in English speaking countries, for example, um, or in Europe, but not so much in Russia or the CIS. When I remember in the mid 2000s, there was a proposal to regulate the sector much more toughly. I don't know if anything's ever come of that. Pavel, did, were there kind of proposals? Do you notice, did you see that in your research? Uh, sir, proposals and what? Proposals to regulate the sector much more toughly and have tougher restrictions on who became an investigator and tests and licenses. Yes, yes. Well, actually, that's um, when I when I was talking about this new law apparently um, uh, coming. Uh, the, one of the one of the discussed one of the rumors say that one of the new measures they will contain is uh, exactly to. Um, to introduce strict um, rules on uh, to whom to grant those kind of licenses. In my understanding, if they trying to increase these um, uh, sets of criteria uh, for this, they should 
grant more privileges or powers to this license. Otherwise, there would be no use of um, making it stricter. Andrew, yeah. I think, you know, to, to, to your point that you were making, what's, what's interesting about Russia is that there is, as we've been discussing, there's so much, and this is CIS in general, there's so much information available. And there's also a tradition of using that information. So there are investigators to whom a new law might apply, but we should remember that there's also uh, corporate security departments at every large company that function in a way that's not as common in, in other jurisdictions. They function essentially as investigators. They gather all kinds of information, whether that's competitive intelligence or background checks or anything of that nature. Um, and for the most part, you know, they're not licensed. So if, if, if new legislation in relation to licensed investigators were passed, it would have to be broadened as to who should be an investigator. And, and that's probably not in the best interest of, of most, you know, interested parties in this case in Russia. Yeah. I mean, I, I always think, and you two guys who are actually expert and from the region, I should say, by the way, that both Pavel and Eugene have their identities disguised in this case, as both of them are out there and actively working and occasionally want to maintain a de degree of um, facial privacy, shall we say. Um, I'm too old to really care about that and no one recognizes me anyway. Um, but I think it's worthwhile going to a little mo moment of history about the thing, which is that there used to be in the FSB and similar organizations, the KGB, something called the active reserve list, where when you'd, le you'd left, you continued to be in the reserves. And I always understood, and maybe this is just fantasy on my part, that what happened was you'd leave, say, the KGB, you'd go and work for one of the big Soviet organizations. And because you were still theoretically an employee, even if an unpaid employee, you had access to the resources, at least some of the resources of the state in that case. I mean, I don't know if that kind of historical vision is in any way ac accurate. Um, either of you, Pavel, Eugene, what do you think? I would well, just say that I, I think, sorry, as practice, I think that's absolutely correct, but I'm not sure that is, uh, technically speaking, that still stands from the standpoint of legislation. I don't know if you disagree, Pavel. Well, uh, no, I would agree, but in terms of that, yes, from the point of view of legislation, actually, uh, the legislation specifically, for example, the law on the private detectives, it it says that no current um, officer of any security, whatever division of the state can uh, act as a private detective. And this one thing and another thing is that, Again, unless I don't know something very, very uh, secret, but there is a categorical no, you cannot access. After you left your uh, position, there's absolutely no way you can legally, uh, using some kind of uh, access, whatever privilege you may have kept, access any kind of information that you were able to when you were uh, on service. And uh, obviously, no, let, let alone to disseminate this kind of information to someone else, like sort of working as a sort of PI. No, it's, um, it's, it, it is, as Eugene said, yeah, it is, it is probably a common practice, uh, but this practice is based not on the legal way, it means of, um, it's mostly based on some connections that they still keep with their former colleagues. Okay, so let's, I'm sure we'll come on to what may be obtainable elsewhere, but let's think about what we can get legally. I mean, the thing which I think surprises people totally, particularly those investigators who don't do a lot of work in the CIS, is the amount of information that is readily available incredibly quickly and incredibly legally. So we have databases of all of the press going back for decades, amazingly brilliantly stored, indexed and archived, providing you speak Cyrillic. You read Cyrillic, of course. We've got probably the most precise, detailed and historical company information, both the official database EGRL, which I mean is pretty much unsurpassed in the level of data, and then the private database, which super is superimposed on top, Spark, which is incredibly 
detailed and precise so as you can just put anyone's name in and you can get a complete list of all of the companies they own, connected with, been an officer of, and you can build it out like a dynamic I2 diagram. And this is pretty cheap and completely available everywhere. Um, you know, it's you know, certainly better than Germany, certainly better than the US, um, certainly a lot more accurate than the UK, I'd say. I don't know, Eugene, what's your experience elsewhere in the region with you? Well, so with regard to Russia, I would just say I think you're absolutely right. And there are other sources of information as well that don't exist in countries like Germany or France or even the UK. In other countries, I think it's a bit more of um, um, it's a bit more of black hole type situations. I, I would say that in the Eastern European states, so in, in Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, Belarus, there is that exact tradition that you're talking about of, of database collection and information that's accessible. As we move more into the other CIS countries, so the Stans and the Caucasus, it's it's much more difficult and, and probably for two reasons, I think. One is, in some cases, cultural or political, so Azerbaijan, which explicitly banned the disclosure of corporate information. And the other reason, I think, it just there was less of that information collection there because everything was so centralized, so everything was always in Moscow and in the early beginnings of those countries' current existences, that was the case too. And then the information is just limited. Um, and it's also everybody in those countries, for the most part in the professional world, speaks Russian, but the information is not in Russia. So Armenia will have information in Armenia, you know, Uzbekistan will have it in Uzbek and, and, and so on. So that, that makes it difficult as well. And I think the thing I love about Azerbaijan is they used to be a really good corporate database. I don't know if you remember, but as soon as they discovered people were using it to look up the ruling family's hidden assets, allegedly, um, the database was switched off with a very dramatic kind of, no, we don't want you to look at that, which, um, you know, it pays to protect your privacy sometimes. You're absolutely right, and it's Azerbaijan is a very specific country in the sense that there are a lot of very important people who actually hold their assets in and through the country, which is not the case almost anywhere else, because in most other CIS countries, assets are always almost always held, you know, from outside of the place itself. Yeah, I think it was a requirement of the Azeri government for a period of time that. Um, your assets should be where other people could get hold of them if need be. That's right. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the nodding figures, of which I can see, and you, of course, can only see the icons. So you have no way of telling if they're agreeing with me or just saying shut up words. Well. But, um, no, no, we agree. <laughs> no, uh, we agree, absolutely agree, yeah, yeah. Um, so, Eugene, you were saying there are other good databases which are unavailable elsewhere and a public record. Let's, we'll think about the other ones in a second or two. What else is available and what else should be, people should be thinking they can get accessibly and legally out of the CIS? Well, first, to, to go back to EGRUL, which is the, the official corporate register, when you, you said absolutely correctly that there is a wealth of information there. And, and one type of information I would just point out is that the dates that um, where the company did anything administrative are always recorded, which usually is pointless, except when it isn't, because then you can put you know pieces together and and determine that on a certain date the company requested to change something in its administrative status. And if you know something else happened on that date, that is brilliant and not available in most other jurisdictions. Um, in terms of corporate information, there's also going back to the early 2000s, if not before, public companies. Um, have to make extremely detailed um, disclosures about everything that they do, essentially, um, perhaps minus bank accounts, but almost everything else. And that information generally predates, um, you know, the, the existence of such databases like the SEC Edgar database in the United States, for example. Um, and so that's very useful going back in time, especially because a lot of Russian companies, especially big companies, typically have been around since the beginning. Their ownership has changed, their structures have changed, but the corporate entities, the big conglomerates often have been and remain the same. Um, uh, the other last point I would make, I think, and there's more, but 
is that there's also, um, for a variety of reasons that, that we could debate, but there, there are a lot of uh, disclosure requirements on almost any official representative of the Russian government. So I, I read recently there's over one million individuals in Russia who have to disclose their assets, and that would include, you know, regional administrative heads, judges, uh, heads of departments who are appointed, and, and so on and so forth. And that information is... Uh, there are a couple of databases where it's collected um, in a consistent manner, but even if it isn't, in theory, you could you could find if you're looking for whether or not a judge you think you know shouldn't be driving the kind of car that he or she is driving, you you can in theory look up that disclosure in a fairly accessible manner. And I can't think of any other country, to be honest, right now, with that detail of disclosure. Um, of course, the the reason behind this is to root out corruption. Um, that's whether or not that's effective is probably more debatable, but, but the information is there and available. And, 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 and again, for individuals that we often don't think would ever need to disclose something, not just heads of, uh, you know, major state owned oil companies, but, but heads of small metal producers who happen to be owned by the, I don't know, the, the regional Tomsk administration or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, that data is always amazing, particularly when you get kind of political figures who suddenly disclose and you think, why have they done this? Oh, I own a parking space in Switzerland. And this little bit of information gives you well, what no one owns a parking space without a house. So it then gives you a clue as to where to look for the property. People also normally own parking spaces reasonably close to their houses. Um, no. I can, I can think of another country with a similar granularity of disclosure for their um, political um, exposed persons. It's Ukraine. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Ukraine is very, very detailed and, and perhaps yeah. because it's smaller, it's much more centralized. Um, no, it's because they really want to prove the world that they are um, anti-corruption now. No, <laughs> I mean, yeah. truth be told. Doing to job, demonstrate but... to the world that they are anti-corruption now, that they are clean. <laughs> okay, either, yeah, demonstrate <laughs> and prove. Yeah, I agree. No, I agree, I agree. agree with that. <laughs> um, okay, so what else do we, what else are the classic sources of information? Property information, completely available online everywhere in the CIA, everywhere in Russia, certainly, and I think Kazakhstan. No, Kazakhstan? not so much. Yeah, yes, no. No, in the other CIS countries, in the Stans and the Caucasus, that tends to be either confidential or just not readily available. That's actually something that in certain instances, uh, if I'm not remembering exactly, but in, in Kazakhstan, I think as well, that, that that sometimes is the kind of information that somebody would need to go and request in person. Uh, Ukraine has some of those particularities as well, where you need a national ID, for example, to look something up. Um, and that's, you know, I'm not sure if that's really intended to um, to keep information locally accessible or to provide an opportunity for foreigners to hire Ukrainians to gather records. But either which way, it's, uh, it's sometimes the case. There, there's also, by the way, Andrew, in terms of, uh, I think you were uh, referencing earlier, the, the leaked databases, which have now become public for many, many years, now decades actually, but, but that has address information. So... If you think about uh, information on uh, people's, um, if you need a date of birth, you can look up readily available uh, records for car registrations or address histories, which often include dates of birth. And that information, you know, whether or not it could pass the, the burden of evidence if really needed is difficult to say, but in, by experience, it's extremely accurate and very widely used and is de facto. Well, I think you know, I thought Pavel's point was very interesting and probably a little bit of background for people who didn't travel to Russia in the late 90s, early 2000s. On every street corner in Moscow at this time, or almost every street corner, you would find a large table covered with bootlegged CDs, um, DVDs of Rocky, things of this kind, on the sale for pennies. <laughs> and among these CDs would be a CD-ROM of things like all of the cars registered in European Russia or property databases or pension payments. And thinking about Pavel's question of whether you're commissioning the theft of the information, 
you know, it was certainly never treated as being illegal buying this stuff. And indeed, for years, I used to have it as a task for all of my researchers. They had to go off and buy as many of these CD-ROMs as possible and then installed them on computers. They were always riddled with viruses and in really obscure and peculiar Russian databases, which nobody had ever seen before or since. So it was always a good challenge. It was kind of an initiative test. <laughs> um, those are less available, I think you'd be safe to say now, Pavel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you this. Yes, uh, absolutely true. And, and I just visualized when you started talking about those, um, the tables with the seed, with this bootleg syndrome, very nice, uh, elegant expression. Um, well, today, they, uh, it's, uh, it's on uh, USB hard drives. So it's, they, they upgrade it and they, um, again, it's less and less. Okay, to answer your question, it is less and less available, but I wouldn't say uh, it's not available, but yes. Okay, well, the common trend is uh, that the, 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 the Russian government, uh, they became aware of, well, okay, geopolitically speaking, broadly speaking, they became aware of the whole mess in the country and more specifically talking is that they became aware of um, a mess about the information leakage from their uh, all kind of different bodies and agencies. And yes, the rules became stricter and the protocols became stricter. And yes, it's uh, uh, the black market is not as uh, wide as it used to be, which is a good thing. So uh, is it, it is not more as regulated. Severe or has it become a little bit more gray, do you think, in some ways? No, I, well, from black to gray, you mean? No, I, it's as black as it was. I mean, it's still black. I mean, still, it, you still cannot leak any kind of this information uh, to any kind of the CDs or hard drives. But and it's um, but the leakages happen all the time from 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 telecom or from 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 taxes or from insurance companies. This kind of stuff still go out, but get out, but. Um, Less and less, yes. I mean, it's kind of symbolic on a deep, rebellious, anti-establishment strain inside the Russian civil service psyche that people keep on leaking this information regularly, year by year. And I don't know what it means, but it certainly means something. We need to get a sociologist to think about it. But, you know, if you think no, it was nowhere near this amount of leakage, say, out of the French government, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it does touch upon an issue of, yes, yeah, some, some form of, uh, of rebellion, whatever the reason may be for it, because it's also not very lucrative in the sense of when these things are leaked. They're not sold to somebody. They're actually leaked. So it's hard to imagine that anybody's making any, any you know, dirty money off of this. It's just to actually disclose the information, perhaps in a way to, to you know, to make it easier in some ways for people to investigate and be investigated. And again, the motivations could be complex, but but you're absolutely right that it, it keeps happening again and again, and it does not happen in other places, even in the CIS, actually. Well, I would I would again being as um, I'm less I'm less um, optimistic about you know the civil society. I, I think uh, the motives behind um, mostly commercial, and you'd be surprised. I mean, uh, when you read those um, those cases and from from the law. Uh, people do sell, and in regions like whatever they sell, and people get sentenced for I don't know selling uh, some billing statements for I don't know a hundred dollars. So yes, it doesn't look like something very lucrative. Still happens, still happens, and still happens for the money. But I don't deny that there is a slight, well, a portion of people who some for whatever reasons in their head they think that uh, leaking confidential information is going to help them to build the uh, civil society. Um, Pavel, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> there was my vision of loads of um, secret um, anarchists sitting inside the system, desperate to produce information flow. We're getting um, questions. We are getting questions. Let's go do one more. One. Okay. Are officials' interests in foreign companies part of disclosure? Disclosure. And a Ukrainian official who avoided disclosing his position as a director in a Slovenian company. Do you know what they risk if they don't disclose everything? I don't. Eugene, you are our 
token person of Ukrainian blood. What does the Ukrainian regulation say? Um, I um, token. I, I'll take issue with that, but uh, for later. <laughs> Um, you know, to be honest, in Ukraine, for example, and Russia, I think is similar. In theory, they risk quite a bit because you do need to disclose everything, whether or not it's foreign or not. Um, so in theory, if you're an official who doesn't disclose, you could be removed from your position. Um, if you're an elected official, you could be fined. I don't think it's criminal, but there are serious fines. But in practice, I, you know, I'm not totally up to date on this, but I, I'd be venture, I'd venture to say that there's probably never or almost never been in recent memory any sort of serious punishment because in the media, it actually happens all that this exact situation happens all the time. Journalists scour disclosures nonstop 24 seven to see what, you know, what they can find in Slovenia, then they publish it. And then the next day it dies down and not much happens. Well, we just well, have a sorry, yeah, I, I, I would say that Ukraine is probably not the best example here uh, because, uh, yes, we don't see it much because the Ukrainian uh, uh, um, government is very, is preoccupied today with chasing after all the previous um, establishments and um, people of power. So, and you, you can see and they have this anti-corruption anti bureau. I don't remember the exact name, but it has these three names in the name for sure. That's right. There's, yeah, low budget, but quite efficient, they say. Uh, low budget, I mean, they don't really contract anyone outside of their own uh, resources. Well, they do, they want, but again, that's a different story. So they're not very good. Um, they want open partnership with the FBI, by the way. That's probably why. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so they probably don't need, but they, they say they're quite efficient in chasing after the, the, the all these hidden interests and assets uh, hidden abroad uh, for the former um, uh, government members. Yeah, yeah. So, for the, the yes, there the is there is the position for sure. Uh, any any official position uh, officer, he will lose the position. Okay, oh, we've got another question. What's the best investigative tool, data tool you are familiar with in the case of the CIS region? I'm going to take a moderator's privilege and say Spark so as to leave the problem for you guys. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, it's a, it's, it's very. I think Spark and, and, and um, Andrew, you referenced the media database, Integrum. Um, I would even say Integrum over Spark because Integrum includes a lot of Spark and Spark does not. Spark is corporate type information and Integrum has a lot of corporate information, but also as Andrew alluded to earlier, you know, the, the I don't know, the Novosibirsk Times from 2003, January, that, that article will be there. Um, so I think it's it's absolutely essential. The interface is also from January 2003, but you know otherwise it works very well. Pavel, no. Yes, yes, I I agree with both, and uh, yeah, Yandex I, also so, was also when you, sorry with the person mentioned Google, I would also suggest using Yandex, which is the Russian browser, and it searches better. Uh, for the Russian, with the Russian part of the internet, yes, when it comes to Russian language, yeah. absolutely. And I'll throw yeah. the, the one other tool I would throw out there straight away because it has solved more cases for me in the last three years than anything else is Instagram. As long as young people of Russia are desperate to take photographs of themselves on whatever yacht they find themselves. Assets That's very true. Will be made very true. Easier. <laughs> um, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Um, oh, I'm going to leave that pronunciation to you, Pavel. <laughs> <laughs> I think the short answer is probably not directly. No, you do need an account typically. Uh, you, you do you do need an account and I'm telling you to get an account at this website even for a Russian citizen based in Russia like myself I it was quite a challenge it was quite a challenge okay, so you have to explain what the question is because otherwise but the question is how to, it's actually basically the e-government uh, hmm. website and database uh, and it has lots of uh, very interesting resources for sure but um, and for the investigation for collecting information but um, no, uh, if you if you no, you can't you, you can't use them without a verified. I mean, I don't I don't. Well, I probably probably there is a way. I just never needed one. But um, in my understanding, there is no. 
Okay, so we're going to skip on because it's probably relevant in a way. David asks, David Marchant, our host, why are Russian hackers considered to be the best in the world? Um, Eugene, do you feel Russian hackers are the best in the world? I've always aspired to Ukrainians, but... Um, well, I was going to say, I think the reputation is, is still in Ukraine, but but I would say, um, without sounding too silly, but I think there's something to be said about um, the Soviet and early Russian stress on math education. Um, I think that's really, the, the, that's the basic and, and, and serious reason for that. So, you know, other things like tools and perseverance and motivation and resources, all of that would not exist without the background that that allowed people from that's why you know if we look at if we look at the world's internet technology companies how many of them are founded by russians even before russia was the power that it is today you know that probably answers it i, I think i saw pavel agreeing with me yeah yes absolutely. I think absolutely hacking like any form of smart criminality is a product of having a poor but well-educated population and Russia's got an incredibly well-educated population which suffered disastrous economic collapse in the 1990s. And that produced a, a group of very well-educated, hard-working people who are willing to put the hours in. There's no, you know, hacking like lots of these things, like for Nigerian running, Nigerians running fraud, it's a product of education and motivation. And, you know, probably the same reason you get very good Indian hackers or Ukrainian hackers, you probably don't get very good hackers from the Netherlands where um, people haven't had the same driving force as poverty. A very good soccer players from Brazil, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and Argentina, look at Maradona. Um, what else do we think one should? We've got two minutes left, so probably we should probably touch on one question and one question only, which is that in using a certain kind of Russian subcontractor, particularly 10 years ago, they would deluge you with information which one now knows to be, have been illegally obtained because it was very easy to obtain illegal information. How does one guard against that and guard against putting one's client in an embarrassing position by handing some, them something saying it is factual and acceptable when in actual fact when it gets into court they will just be shouted at and and knocked back um eugene sure. i mean I, I to be honest i think it's a real conundrum that i'm not sure how to get out of because it's um it's a serious challenge and i think the best way to work around may not be the right phrase but the best way to address it is to know what could or could not have been legally obtained, recognize it and inform the client uh, accordingly. Because there are certain types of information as we've been discussing in Russia that look like they shouldn't be publicly available, but they are and vice versa. Um, uh, but I, you know, it's, as uh, just one last point is, as I'm sure we've had experiences like that, when we find something out, we know it's credible. Um, then you find the workaround on how to prove in reverse you know, reverse engineer, prove it from the other side. Yeah, Pavel? Well, yeah, it's a, philosophically speaking, it's, um, it's as what Eugene said, but very, very but practically speaking, you just need to double check and see who you're dealing with and what kind of information they provide you and ask them and then see, do you common sense? I mean, whether that kind of information can be obtained legally or not. Yeah. You can further address this in theory versus practice 101. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last question. If we have, yes, so 20 seconds, so really quick answers. What's the major difference between investigative journalism and anti-money laundering investigation? Is there any difference? Intent. That's the major difference. It's intent. But then, then you can only guess. Yeah. Intent, absolutely intent, but 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 also um, the uh, objective in a slightly different way, meaning that anti-corruption investigations are trying to, the, the, the investigative journalists in Russia operating today work in a, in a different, they have a bit of a different approach, probably more sophisticated than AML investigations, it's much broader. Yeah, 
I'd, I'd agree strongly. Thank you so much, gentlemen. A real pleasure Thank talking. You. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to our investigative news and documents service and attending our events. For more information, visit offshorealert.com.